Hi, everyone. Um, uh, welcome to our session. Um, we are just going to get started in just a minute there. I uh, That was a great video. Thank you to Sankalp for sharing. I am just going to quickly share my screen and for us to get started. Okay. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. I am based in Washington, D.C., so it is very early morning for us. Um, thank you again for joining this session and for Sankalp uh, for hosting us. Um, the session is Smarter Systems, How Tweaking Your Due Diligence Process Can Unlock Overlooked Opportunities. Um, my name is Heather Matranga, and I am the VP of Impact Investments at Village Capital. I'll explain a little bit more about Village Capital in a moment, but first want to introduce um, my uh, colleague, Natalie. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to meet you all virtually. I'm Natalie. I'm an associate on the innovations team at Village Capital and really looking forward to, to sharing with you all um, our, our research. I'll pass it over to Amisha. Hi everyone, I'm Amisha Miller, I'm from Boston University. Um, I'm currently doing my PhD, finishing my PhD in fact, on uh, gender disparities in investments. Um, this is part of the dissertation. I worked with the Village Capital team to really build up um, this as part of a research agenda. Really excited to share it with you and to talk more about it. Great, thank you. Um, and just to give you a little bit more context about Village Capital, um, Village Capital, we've been around since around 2009, and our focus has really been on, on unlocking capital for impact creating startups globally. Um, we really have an emphasis on supporting startups that uh, with lived experience and those that tend to exist in investor blind spots, meaning those that are usually overlooked by traditional venture capital. Um, we have supported over 1,400 entrepreneurs across 28 countries um, through, uh, oh, apologies, um, and have unlocked and catalyzed more than $5 billion in capital. Um, our work, we really take an ecosystems level approach, meaning that we work directly with entrepreneurs um, to support uh, their investment readiness and help them attract capital. We also work with other entrepreneur support organizations, accelerators, incubators to help build out their capacity to support entrepreneurs. And then we work with investors. And this work that we've been doing in the gender lens investing space really cuts across all three of um, those uh, focus areas for us. Um, and it's really part and parcel of Village Capital's work uh, in focus on unlocking capital for entrepreneurs with lived experience. Um, before I run through the agenda, I did want to just get a sense of who is in the virtual room with us today. Um, and so I'd love uh, in the chat if you are, um, if you're an investor, if you could just say um, hi in the chat. Any investors in the room? Is everyone able to access the chat? <laughs> Okay, perfect. Um, are, if you are a um, entrepreneur support organization, so an accelerator, an incubator, um, an organization that works directly with entrepreneurs to help uh, build out their capacity and support them. Can you just note in the chat? Just a quick hi. Okay, what about an ecosystem enabler, an organization that helps fund a lot of the work um, that entrepreneur support organizations do um, to help uh, support or to help support entrepreneurs and build out entrepreneur ecosystems? You just say hi in the chat. Great. Um, and then finally, um, I'd love to hear if anyone has uh, a familiarity or a focus on gender lens investing. So any work that you've done in um, improving gender disparities in capital allocation or supporting women entrepreneurs specifically, just to get a sense of uh, experience in this regard. Just say hi in the chat. Okay. 
Um, well, great. So today we are going to talk um, about three specific strategies that Village Capital, in collaboration um, with a coalition of partners and uh, Amisha Miller and Sarah Blah, who are both both also on the call, um, have co-developed to really address the gender financing gap. And we'll spend the bulk of our time talking about these three specific strategies that um, we think are very easily implementable um, and uh, data-driven. Um, but first, just to run through the agenda for our discussion today, we're first going to frame out what the problem is that we're trying to solve, talk through the actual um, design of our research to give you some context about how we develop these solutions, and then spend the bulk of the discussion on the solutions. Um, so to get us started, uh, and I'm going to ask folks to sort of interact in the chat or raise your hand um, uh, to come off mute, but uh, we'd like to make this more of an interact interactive session to the extent possible in a virtual environment. Um, but uh, first, I just wanted to get a sense um, from everyone uh, what we think the gender financing gap is. I kind of previewed the answer a little quickly here, so I might just give, give an overview of it. Um, the gender finance gap, the way that Village Capital defines it, we are talking about the gap between women-led entrepreneurs' ability to raise capital and by women-led entrepreneurs, we really define that as all women founding teams or mixed gender founding teams um, where there's a woman on the founding team um, compared to the ability for all men founding teams to raise capital. And what we've seen really over the past 12 years is that the, that there's about an 85% um, difference in the ability for men to raise capital, meaning that 85% of venture capital globally goes to all men founding teams, less than 2%, uh, uh, and that number fluctuates a little bit, goes to all women founding teams. And then the big fluctuation has really been in um, the ability for mixed gender founding teams to raise capital. And despite numerous efforts, efforts over the past 10 years, a lot of attention and focus and prioritization on addressing this gap, we really haven't seen that much of a change in um, the how capital is allocated. The needle's moved a little bit since 2010, but um, certainly not quickly enough, um, which is really, which is what really led us to um, try to determine what is causing this underlying gap and are there really tactical ways that we can address it. So in um, 2019, 2020, we conducted a study in partnership with the uh, Global Accelerator Learning Initiative, um, which is uh, which was a, a really a research initiative led by the Aspen Network of Development Entrepreneurs and Emory University to collect data on the effectiveness of accelerators. So that initiative really focused on do accelerators work? Accelerators, meaning the the entrepreneur support organizations that are really focused on helping build up um, the capacity of entrepreneurs, helping scale entrepreneurs, um, helping unlock capital for entrepreneurs. Are they effective? Uh, we leverage that data to determine if accelerators have a role in addressing the gender financing gap. Our thought was accelerators are really meant to help unlock capital. So it, it would it seemed to um, align with the concept that they are also in helping unlock capital, actually reducing that gender financing gap um, that I just showed on the previous slide. To our dismay and somewhat surprise, we actually saw that accelerators are um, exacerbating the gender financing gap, meaning that they're making the gap worse. You can see in this slide um, sort of an in, a, a visual illustration of how that's taking place. And basically, uh, what we found is that rather than um, uh, what accelerators are really, really effective at helping men raise capital. And when, when we're talking about capital, I'm really focusing on equity from a uh, venture capital equity lens or equity like instruments um, that so accelerators are really, really access, uh, um, successful at helping men raise capital. 
However, they don't have much of an impact on helping women-led startups raise capital. Um, so if you think about it, the role of an accelerator, which is making a lot of introductions and bringing in mentors that um, are, are on the supply side, so capital providers, investors, um, may, opening the door, making those introductions, those introductions aren't necessarily turning to actual deals or actual flow of capital for women entrepreneurs. Um, uh, Natalie can drop in the chat the um, study. We have a whole report on, on how we conducted the study if you wanted more information on it. So I'm not gonna belabor the point here, um, but it did lead us to really try to understand what what is causing this, uh, this uh, disparity, this gap. And so if you could in the chat, if you have any thoughts on what might be contributing to this gap, I'll give you about a minute to um, add those thoughts. Or if you want to um, raise your hand, I I'm ha I can't see everyone though. Anyone have any ideas of what might be contributing to this gap? Yep, networks is something that we hear that women just aren't in the right networks. All right, other things that we often hear are exactly skills and experience. We also hear that there could be a sector, geographic difference. Perhaps women are in women led startups are often in sectors that are less capitalized. So we took all of these uh, assumptions that kind of uh, uh sometimes that that uh we assume could potentially contribute to the gender finance gap really observable characteristics about the startup so a lot of the things that were mentioned um uh, things like experience education even age of the of the founder and uh things about the startups like um what are their what's their growth margins, um, what are their commercial objectives, what sector are they in, what geography are they in. And we held all of those constant in the um, study, so we controlled for those. And all things being equal, we see that this gender financing gap persists, which really led us to a hypothesis that it's much more about just the makeup of the founding team. It's not about the experience. Sure, maybe perhaps some of that. It's not about awareness. It's not about um, the characteristics of the startups. Rather, it's simply about the gender makeup of the founding team, um, which has led us to a hypothesis that it's much more about the way that investors are making investment decisions or the the what the investors are bringing um, to that decision-making process that is continuing to see uh, this disparity in um, capital allocation between men and women. Um, so uh, we worked with a consortium of partners to figure out what can we do about this? If we think that it's something around the, the way that investors are engaging with startups, are there particular strategies that investors can employ to, um, to make more objective investment decisions to really um, take some of that, uh, what we would call bias out of the decision-making process? Um, so we teamed up with the IFC, the the Women's Entrepreneurship Finance Initiative and a consortium of other partners, Visa, Foundation, Moody's, the Aspen Network of Development Entrepreneurs, SGB Evidence Fund, um, Saskawa Peace Foundation, as well as academic uh, research partners, Amisha Miller, Sora Blal, um, and worked with the World Bank Gender Innovation Lab uh, to uh, where they provided research guidance to conduct a really data-driven, rigorous study to, to to test specific strategies that investors can use, all with the idea of making these really practical, really tactical. Um, and uh, that's what we're going to discuss today. So I actually am going to turn it over to Amisha Miller, who knows all things research, um, and she's going to talk through the overall methodology, why we made some of the choices that we made, how we designed the research um, before we get into the meat of what we actually, um, what we actually found. So Amisha, I, I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you. And Heather, I'm assuming you're in charge of the slides. So um, let's, let's move on to the next one. Great. All right, so um, I'm Amisha from, the, uh, from Boston University. And something we re were really thinking about is what could the issue be with investor selection processes and evaluation processes when they're evaluating 
startups in general. Um, and we, we did a lot of a, a large literature review on thinking about strengthening the evaluation process to reduce gender bias in startup invest assessments. Um, we initially looked at sourcing. There's a lot of research around the fact that women may not have the right networks. Um, after talking to Village Capital specifically, we realized that their sourcing is broad and they tap very deeply into, into networks. And that was something we decided not to focus on in this study. It's also something that's been studied previously and we can talk more about that. Um, we thought about screening, like was it possible that women just weren't getting in to any kind of assessment process uh, that Village Capital was running? And we found that in fact, women are getting through the initial process. So it's actually something in the evaluation process in this context. Um, that is not working well. And we found this interesting because there's not so much research around how the actual evaluation process of investors might be affecting um, gender disparities in investments. And so that's where we decided to focus our efforts, uh, partly because it made sense in this field site and Village Capital actually gave us access to it, which is extremely rare, um, and partly because this is something that's understudied, yet evaluation processes happen in a lot of different contexts. And so this findings from this research, we hoped would inform um, a lot of different other contexts as well. So you can imagine different uh, venture capital firms, accelerator groups, um, angel groups can all learn from this. We're also hoping that this can inform more general evaluation processes when people are assessing startups or assessing innovation. Okay, and so this is the experiment. Uh, we ran a randomized control trial. The reason that we did this is because we thought it was very important to try and make a causal link between an evaluation process change and then an outcome in investments. Um, so we, we very carefully crafted um, an RCT. These are risky um, and expensive, hence the massive research coalition. Um, we did a lot of pre-work. So I did 95 interviews with investors. I observed two organizations making investments. We ran a couple of lab in the field experiments. We ran a, a few other experiments. And I'm going to describe the one experiment that we ran um, with Village Capital um, on a real investment decision taking place in eight regions in the world. So um, we first conducted a randomized control trial in eight programs. that They were across Africa, India, Latin America, and MENA. We collected data on 1,503 evaluations, and this allowed us to assess over 30,000 score points um, of investors assessing startups. That resulted in 651 investment decisions. In our sample, we have 65 trainee investors making decisions on 69 startups, and 46% of those are female founders um, in the startup. Um, and what we, what we were manipulating, the investment outcome that we were looking at, is uh, three, uh, $320,000 invested into 16 of 69 startups. Um, so that was 20,000 into four startups per region. Um, we, um, we only analyzed the scores given by investors who participated in all rounds of evaluation. Um, otherwise, it gives you very noisy estimates of people that are dropping in or dropping out. And we find very similar um, results even when we analyze the whole thing, um, but we're focusing on the cleaner estimates that we think we get from people that participated through the whole program. All right, and then what we actually did, um, we added three steps to Village Capital's evaluation process. What we were really thinking about trying to do is create more objective, consistent, comprehensive, and data-driven startup evaluations. So we were really looking for things that would improve evaluation not necessarily attract attention to the fact that we were thinking about disparities or biases in the investment process. And the reason that we did this is that often when you highlight the fact that someone is biased or that there are groups that might be missing out, there's a danger of backlash. And we really wanted to avoid that happening in our context. So we focused on these objective evaluation processes that can be applied in most organizations. Uh, one of them is predefining the criteria. So rather than saying what you're assessing after you assess it. Make sure you do that before. Uh, the second is collecting information on startups' risk and growth, because we know that investors in general tend to ask more risk-focused questions to women. And then the third was assessing a team's potential over time, because we know that uh, if you assess female leaders' potential in other contexts, um, evaluators are less likely to believe they have potential to grow in other contexts and more likely to believe what they've already done. 
Um, so those are the, the three um, steps that we added, and we'll talk much more about how we implemented them um, in, the next, in the next slides. Um, I guess just a very quick overview of what we decided to do and, and how we created the interventions. Does anyone have any questions on the research methodology or how we did this? Um, I'm going to put my email in the chat as well, just so that if anyone is a, is a nerd, um, please feel free to reach out to me. Okay, so uh, it looks like we can just move on uh, to the main finding, which is essentially that adding these three steps to the investment evaluation process reduced the overvaluation of male-led startups and the undervaluation of startups with female founders. Um, and so I'm going to show you what this looks like. On the left-hand side, what you can see is what happens in the control group. So you can see that in general, men are receiving higher scores than women. Um, and then when you look over time, at uh, the final evaluation, which determines investments, you can see that these numbers are, become, are coming closer, um, but there's a strong anchoring effect from the first score that people get. So essentially men are still scoring higher than women um, in the control group. Then when you move over to the, the right-hand side of this slide, what you can see is that we actually have a slight difference right at the beginning. And that's because we applied one of the treatments um, on the left-hand side of this graph. So we applied the, um, whether investors ask risk and growth questions um, in, this, in this setting. And what we see is that does narrow the gap. So we see men still getting higher scores than women, but that gap is narrowed. And then when we continue and, and Im implemented all three of these um, treatments over time, what you begin to see is that female-led startups begin to get higher scores um, than male-led startups. And this is because investors are assessing their progress and assessing a startup dynamically rather than assessing it statically. And they believe that uh, startups with female founders have the potential to grow. Um, so that is an overview of the main result. Any questions on that? All right. So I think we can keep going um, and see see how this goes with the with the workshop. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to to Natalie. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amisha. So um, now we're just going to walk you a little bit more in depth through those three steps. And I have a few questions for you all um, at each point, just to get us thinking about what this would really look like in an evaluation process or even in a selection process for an accelerator program. So if we could go to the next slide. And so how Amisha mentioned, um, the first strategy that we incorporated in the investment evaluation process sought to make the whole process more consistent. And so the purpose was to have investors evaluate all startups consistently, regardless of the gender composition of the founding team. And in order to do that, what we had um, investors do is that we had them use a set framework. Um, and then we also had them, before evaluating, uh, predefine the weight that they would give to a given category. So essentially, how much each category would determine their overall score. And the reason that we did this is because research has found that invest, um, evaluators or investors redefine what success looks like in a candidate to fit the characteristics displayed by candidates of their preferred gender. But it, research has also found that predefining the weight or priority of the category that you're using to evaluate co a company prompts you as an evaluator or really the investor to commit to evaluating all startups more consistently and therefore prevents you from redefining the criteria based on the gender of the founder that you're speaking to. And so, for example, that could help reduce the risk that an investor who really cares a lot about the product isn't minimizing any risks related to that startup's product um, because of the charisma of the founding team that they happen to be evaluating. So if we could go on to the next slide. Uh, and really, as I mentioned just now, this is a two-part process. The first um, part of that process is really just setting and consistently using evaluation criteria. And so to have us think through this a tiny bit more, um, please share in the chat or raise your hand if you'd prefer um, what categories do you typically use or do you think an investor would use to evaluate a startup? And so on the slide, we have a few guiding questions to help you think through this. So um, think about startups in which you um, seem almost equally inclined to work with, but ended up only working with one. Um, what was a key differentiating factor? 
or um, what's a key characteristic or milestone shared by all of your startups that you've worked with recently? So Ruth in the chat is saying traction, scalability. Um, these are great examples. Um, does anybody else have any ideas of how either you evaluate a startup, the criteria you use, or that you think an investor would use? The team, vision. Yeah, exactly. Product. Financial sustainability, market, so impact. This is, yeah, so all of these are great examples of what we often see in evaluation frameworks. So if we could maybe go to the next slide. Um, and here are a few of the ones that you guys mentioned, uh, your business model, scale, problem, and um, vision, uh, product can be other categories. Um, and so what I want you to think about now is when you're evaluating, what are you mostly taking notes on? What are What's the criteria that you're mostly giving attention to? And it may fall within the circle. It may, fall, it may match with what you shared in the chat. But oftentimes, and the reason we ask this is because oftentimes you might have an evaluation framework, but you might be looking at something that's really not categorized within that framework. And what we really want to ensure is that even if it's something that um, seems more ambiguous, like um, the traction, traction isn't as ambiguous, but uh, maybe the hustle of a team, uh, you really want to make sure that that's incorporated in your evaluation framework so that you're evaluating all startups consistently. And so if we could go to the next slide. Uh, the second part of this treatment, as I mentioned initially, is predefining the weight that you apply to each criterion. And so the way we did this was by having investors assign a percentage to represent how much um, any given criteria determined their score or was really important to them. And so um, you'll see that in, in, in the bottom half of the slide here. And one thing that I want to highlight that's important to keep in mind with this step or, or with the second step within this step um, is that this should be consistent across any startup, but this could maybe change depending on if you invest or select startups from different sectors. So you could definitely predefine the weight that you would apply to your criteria per sector, um, but you'd want to use that criteria consistently within that sector or within that investment thesis. Um, and again, the purpose isn't that you necessarily follow these uh, this distribution mathematically, but it does help you remind you of what's most important um, to evaluate consistently. And so another question that I'd want to ask you all, and again, feel free to raise your hand so you can uh, we can unmute you or uh, share in the chat. What do you think investors prioritize? So here again are a few examples that we used in our own evaluation framework, um, but what do you think is most important to an investor when evaluating? And uh, I can't see if people are raising their hands, so I'll ask um, the other hosts to, to keep an eye out for that. But uh, I see leadership um, team in the chat. Those are great examples. Um, maybe um, an ability to execute the market, the scalability could be a priority. So again, the important thing here um, is, is really just to think about what is your priority, what is really guiding your investment decisions, and to apply the weight to that criteria consistently as you evaluate all startups. And so if we move on to the next slide, um, you'll see a screenshot of a template that I will share in the chat with you right now. Um, and in this document, I'll also share it as an attachment. Um, I actually think I can't share it as an attachment. Um, let me know if you're able to access that link, but essentially what you'll find in this document are three templates um, that will help you, that really just illustrate how you can incorporate these steps into your own evaluation process. And so in this one specifically, which you'll find on the first page, uh, you'll have the opportunity to list the criteria that you'll use to evaluate um, a startup and an investment or selection process, assign a weight to it, and then also um, adding any 
guiding questions to help you assess that criteria, um, and then just score the startup consistently. And in practice, we suggest that you do this before evaluating startups in your investment committee in whichever um, format works for you. Um, and just collectively predefine that way and ask if you're um, making these decisions with other people, are the startups that we're putting forward to be invested in or selected in still the stop top startups according to the criteria you set? So essentially compare the startups that you're moving forward in your process with the predefined weight you apply to your criteria and see if really those, um, if there's a, a match between those two. Um, so that's all for the first step. Uh, we can move on, thank you, for the, to the second step. And so the step, second step we incorporated really sought to make the evaluation of all startups more comprehensive. And so to do that, when evaluating each startup, what we had investors do is we had them think about any additional risk or growth related questions um, or really information um, on either of these two areas that they were still missing from a startup. And the reason we did this, um, Misha uh, alluded to this previously, uh, is because research is found, and I'll actually um, put a uh, Harvard Business Review article in the chat that discusses this in more depth, um, but research has found that investors focus more on risk for women-led companies and growth for male-led companies. And so questions like, what are the regulatory hurdles your company is facing versus what is the distribution strategy or size of a market? Um, and it's also important and interesting that investors could also ask the same types of questions, but through a lens of potential gains, as you'll see in this article, or potential losses. So when you're asking about market, you could either ask, do you think that target market is a growing one versus what is the what is to prevent the competition from starting to offer similar services? So really, you're asking about the same thing. You're just asking it through a different lens. And um, just an interesting fact also <clears throat> is that we ran a study previous to this experimental program um, to identify what strategies we wanted to test. Um, and we saw this happen in our own in our own setting. We really only changed the picture of the founder, but, he, but kept the description of the startups the same and found that women were also being asked more um, risk-related questions. And then really the issue with this um, is that it just decreases the accuracy of evaluations. If investors focus too much or too little on one of the two criteria or one of these two areas, Areas, they'll overlook um, the contrary. So they'll overlook risks or growth opportunities that could actually impact their assessment. And so if we move to the next slide, uh, we just have a question for you here as well. And so to help illustrate this, again, feel free to raise your hand or, or pop your answer in the chat. Um, what are some examples of risk and growth focused questions that come to mind for you? Anyone raising their hand? I'm not sure I can see. Um, uh, what are the regulatory requirements for the product? Yeah, competition. That's it's exactly a great example of one that you could either see under a positive or potential gains or potential losses perspective. Uh, if we move to the next slide, we also have a few examples here that we could run through. Market strategy. Um, how you scale geographically. And so, for example, on the risk, um, or I'm sorry, on the reward, reward questions, you could potentially ask, what is your growth strategy? Does the company have plans to work with channel partners? Um, how much can sales increase? Uh, I see in the chat also IP rights. If it's a tech company, that's a great example. And market risk, adverse conditions. On the risk side, we have, um, again, this one was actually shared in the chat, potential regulatory issues or government mandates that could um, occur, uh, competition that could potentially arise, the proof of impact, what, how are people's lives actually changing and how do you know? So all of these are great examples and just helping us differentiate between these two. And so if we move on to the next slide, um, what you'll find in the second page of that template document that I shared with you is a template that you could choose to keep track of the information that you already have on a startup's risks and growth opportunities and that which you still need to collect. And so 
the, uh, Im the, the importance of doing this is, again, it'll really just help you understand if you're overlooking one of the two areas. Um, and it's a helpful tool because usually when you're evaluating, you're not really thinking through, you're not categorizing your questions. This is a growth-related question or this is a risk-related question. But having this, um, really tracking this and writing this down will help you understand, am I focusing too much on one of the, uh, on either of these two areas and could I potentially um, collect more information on, on the other area. And so one thing I would like to mention here and highlight is that we're not suggesting that you necessarily use the exact same number of risk and reward questions when um, evaluating a startup because different startups will warrant different degrees of focus on either of the two areas. But what we're really suggesting is that you um, ensure you're not overlooking the other area. So ensure you really try to have a comprehensive understanding of both. Um, and so similar to what we mentioned in this previous in the previous step during an investment committee, a way you could enhance this is also um, discuss it amongst your peers. So maybe have a challenger and a champion is how we call it. Um, a challenger can really ask and push to see if there are any other additional risks to keep in mind that could affect a, deci a decision. And then a champion could really highlight the startup's growth opportunities. And so that can maybe really just going through what you've written down um, and ensure you again, have a comprehensive understanding of both areas. Um, let's move to, oh, thank you, to the next slide. Uh, and so this last uh, step that we incorporated um, is related to evaluating the team's potential. And so as you'll remember from step one, one of the categories investors evaluate and saw this in the chat as well and put a lot of weight on is the team. Um, and it makes sense because a startup doesn't have a lot of trajectory. And so um, an investor or an accelerator will want to see if they have that ability to execute their vision um, or see if really if they have the potential to succeed. And so what we want to ask you here, just to get us thinking about what we mean by evaluating um, a team specifically, uh, please share again, raise your hand or um, share in the chat what you care about or what you think an investor would care about when evaluating a team's potential. So I remember somebody in the chat wrote leadership. That's a great example that will often be looked at when evaluating a team's potential. Past experience, another great example. Experience in the market specifically, the skills that they may have, academic background, industry knowledge, that's a great example. Testimonials. Skill diversity among the founding team. Any other ones? Yeah, well, these are all great examples. Your gender, yeah, as we've seen in, in our research specifically. Um, and so if we can go to the next slide, um, we asked, we actually asked this question, Amisha asked this question in, in her interviews. And what we found is that um, investors uh, really evaluate their resume, their experience, um, their skills, and all of those things are, are really things you can maybe see on a resume or um, while speaking to, to the startups. But we realize that their decisions aren't only made um, on those observable factors like education and again, experience, um, because investors are evaluating every time that they meet with a startup. And when they're doing that, they're looking at smaller um maybe interactions or characteristics. So a few examples that we have or that we heard from investors is um, assessing the team's learning since they last met them, watching interactions between founders, watching founder reactions to difficult questions. And so all of what this is showing us is that there's a challenge in evaluating potential because it can often be a very am um, ambiguous process that's not consistent and really doesn't use data. And research has also found that evaluating potential really benefits men and harms women because we tend to associate the word potential with characteristics typically associated with men. And so what we sought to do um, was to make the team's evaluation of their potential more accurate and less reliant kind of on that gut instinct. And well, I think that they'll that they they seem to be very confident or, or have all the skills necessary um, based on just your unstructured um, assessment. Um, and rather, we tried to make it more data driven. And so if we go to the next slide, um, 
What we did in our study to do this is we had investors evaluate the founding team's demonstrated ability to improve their startup over time. And in our setting, um, as, as will often happen uh, in evaluation settings, investors met with, um, with startups over uh, multiple times over the course of three months. And so in this case, one thing I want to highlight is when we say improvement, we're not talking about traction or we're, off, we're not suggesting that a startup um, starts from a place where they need improvement. What we really mean um, is the startups or the founding team's demonstrated ability to make progress. Um, and so changing, adapting, strengthening, adjusting their course of action in a way that keeps them towards continual paths to growth. And so that includes providing better explanations to why they've made specific changes um, and maybe even answering um, investor questions about strategic uh, decisions that they've made with more data. And so really all in all, what we're talking about evaluating um, a demonstrated ability to improve the startups, um, the startup overall, what we're really talking about is just having that ability to identify and execute improvements that the startup knows that it'll need to grow and to succeed. And so uh, relatedly to what I was um, talking about just now, the reason that we did this is because evaluating demonstrated ability to make improvements gives the evaluator a much more data-based approach or a much more data-based way to evaluate potential. And so if you have potential, you'll likely need to, be, um, that, that means that you'll be able to grow and make all the decisions that you need to, to get to the place um, to, to scale your startup. And so you need to make the uh, you need to continually make the right improvements to your strategy to get to that place. And so if you have the ability to make the right improvements you need now, it's very likely you'll be able to continue doing so in the future. And again, this just gives us a more comprehensive, um, data-driven, and consistent way of evaluating that, um, that potential. And so if we go to the next slide... Uh, and so in how we did this in our own programs, we really added four categories or four questions to evaluate improvement, um, specifically in the founding team's ability to understand and execute their growth and risk mitigation strategies over time. And the reason we chose these two broader categories are like um, understanding and executing growth and risk uh, risk strategies or risk mitigation strategies is because they're broad enough to apply to any sector um, and in this case, we also had start, um, investors score uh, their performance in each of these areas with a scale from one to four, which you'll see here. Um, so for example, no improvement at all means that the company just really does not present clear new data or insight on how it will grow. Their thinking really hasn't evolved. Um, there's not really a ton of data to back why they're making the decisions that they're making. And then on the opposite side of the spectrum, a four or strong improvement could be that the company has implemented substantive improvements um, in their growth strategy. So new part partnerships um, have reached out to more customers, um, and they really have much more data and reasoning as to why they've made those decisions and how that's translated into the growth or into the improvements that they've made. And so, for example, a question that an investor would use to evaluate these categories or a few of these categories would be, has this company presented more data or details explaining their overall venture growth strategy, so the choices they've made to pursue specific markets, partners, or team members, or has this company demonstrated that it has considered multiple paths to growth and chosen to execute in the most relevant path right now? So. Again, those are more like introspective questions that can be used to, or that we saw investors use to evaluate these categories. And so if we move to the following slide, um, what we want to ask you now that we've talked about evaluating a team's demonstrated ability to make an improvements in an area key for a startup's growth, uh, we want to ask you, what area do you think an investor, or do you as an investor, as a startup evaluator, really want to see improvement in um, in a startup to be able to work with them? And again, I'll just highlight here, um, we evaluated improvement in growth and risk mitigation strategies and understanding and executing those strategies, but you could really evaluate improvement in whatever you consider is most important for the startup. Um, so please let, let us know what um, we're interested in hearing, what you think a startup should um, show improvement in to be able to work with them. Product market fit, revenue, 
Yeah. Maybe one example that always comes to mind is um, if you're investing in startups that develop hardware, uh, you want to make sure that they're making improvements to that hardware. Of course, balancing finance and impact during their scalability, that's a really interesting one. Their commitment, that's a great example. And so um, innovation, that's it. That's very interesting as well. So their ability to make, to improve in, in how they're innovating. Um, these are great examples. Does anybody else uh, want to share anything or maybe raise their hand and share what they consider important for improvement? I think those are all very great examples. Maybe we can go to the next slide. Um, and so similarly, what you'll find in that document that I shared with you um, is a template to evaluate improvement. So evaluating improvement, again, your leadership and innovation and your commitment and balancing finance and impact during scalability, product market fit, revenue, really anything you want to evaluate improvement on. And so how we suggest you do that is, again, you um, set that criteria or, or uh, that guiding principle of improvement um, and then evaluate how they've uh, improved in that area. I see another um, answer in the chat, streamlining, streamlining impact measurement framework and reporting practices. That's a really great, especially if you're an impact investor, that's going to be very important for you. Um, and so what you'll you'll see in this template is that um, you can evaluate improvement over time. And so really take a look at your evaluation process or your assessment, and you'll likely find opportunities to collect improvements over time and, um, and really in between the moments that you've met with them or that you last checked in. Um, and really, if you only meet with them once, you could potentially do a retrospective question. But if you look into your evaluation framework, there will likely be more than one meeting point where you'll be, where you'll be able um, to evaluate improvement in that given period of time. And so one thing we also recommend is that when you put a startup on your watch list and you want to revisit them in the future, um, at the present time when you're meeting with them, it's important to collect the information um, of how they're doing in that specific area now um, so that when you meet with them in the future, you'll have something to contrast to. So you'll say, have they really made improvement based on this point um, to when I'm meeting them now? So in the future. Um, and in our toolkit that we'll be launching very soon later um, in October, you will find all of these templates and um, accompanied by question banks that will help you evaluate um, these different categories and just really incorporate this into your process. Um, so if we go to the next slide, the one after, sorry. <laughs> So having gone through all of these steps, um, I do want to take a moment to see if anybody has any questions on how this can be incorporated in your own process or if you um, have any questions about what, how we um, really just the content of the steps. Um, but a question we also want to ask you is how could you incorporate these steps into your own process and what challenges do you anticipate facing while doing that? And again, feel free to unmute yourself. Um, or raise your hand and, and just share your answers in the chat. Any, any feedback on of how you can incorporate these steps or, or challenges you may anticipate? So I can share a story. I told um, yeah. Natalie I might do this um, about how Village Capital reacted um, to trying to incorporate some of these um, into their own process. Um, and I think initially everybody was excited. I think Village Capital, their aim is really to try to improve investments into a wide range of entrepreneurs. And so for them, gender is important. Um, Something they struggled a lot with was how to incorporate this idea of progress. Um, so the sourcing team initially came back and said, look, like we see entrepreneurs once, they come in or they don't, um, we cannot assess whether they've made any progress. And so we had to talk them through, well, what does the actual process look like? Um, and we saw that at the beginning, there's an application form. And then um, once the application forms are sifted, uh, a set of entrepreneurs go through to interviews. 
And that was when we noticed that there is a time period there that entrepreneurs may be making changes to their business. So rather than treat the interview as kind of a check on what they said in the application form, you can do that too, but also add a question to say, have, we see, have you made any progress since you filled out the application form? Or are there any changes in your business we need to know about uh, since you filled out the form? And that gave them a much better way of measuring progress during their evaluation. Um, so that's just an example of how it might initially seem like progress is not something you can assess in the short term, um, but actually for Village Capital, it was something they, they realized that they could. Thank you so much for sharing that example, Misha. Um, I think that it, as you're mentioning, it does require a shift and, and it is a process of incorporating these steps, but it's definitely possible and really related to what we're seeing in the chat here. Um, it does require sens sensitization or um, training to um, in incorporate these uh, practices into your organization's evaluation process. Um, it requires being flexible, as somebody has mentioned in the chat. Uh, and then a challenge that I see here is also shift in funding priorities. And that's a great example. And I think that what's interesting about these steps is that um, they're really malleable to whatever funding priorities you have. So for example, if you're predefining your criteria, um, you can redefine how you predefine your criteria as your investment priorities change um, or your funding priorities change. Um, and, and the other two steps are really just open to whatever you need to focus on in that given step in time. And what's important is to really try to consistently do it across all startups. Um, because again, the purpose of all these steps is to ensure that your assessments are more consistent, comprehensive, and data-driven. Um, and so thank you all for all of uh, your feedback and the answers that you shared is very interesting um, to read through your comments. Um, as I mentioned, we will be sharing our toolkit um, in October. So you can sign up for when that launches in the link that I am sharing in the chat right now. Um, that will be composed of a key insights report where we'll talk about what we incorporated um, in our evaluation process, what we learned, a, a much more detailed analysis of what we learned and what it, what it tells us about investor behavior and evaluations. Um, and then it'll also have implementation guides for investors and for accelerators. So we're really looking forward to um, sending you guys this report and hopefully you'll enjoy it uh, and it'll be very useful for your organization. Um, you can find a QR code to download that in the slide on the left hand side and we'd also really appreciate um, your feedback on the session. So if you could please take a minute just to um, complete the survey that you'll see on the right hand side of the screen or in the link that I shared in the chat, we would be very, very grateful. So thank you all for your um, for your time. If you have any additional questions, we do have a few minutes left. So please, please feel uh, free to raise your hand or share them in the chat. Um, don't know if maybe Amisha or Heather want to give any final wrapping words as we get um, any potential questions. Oh, Heather, I think we can't, we can't hear you right now. You might be on mute. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, two years into the pandemic and pressing unmute is still a challenge. <laughs> um, but thank you, Natalie and Amisha, for sharing all of that. I know it's a lot of information to digest, but it really is... Uh, there, there really are three simple steps, and it's not about um, being perfect and implementing them perfectly. It's just about starting to make progress towards implementing them so we can see an actual shift in this gender financing gap. So again, consistency, comprehensive, and data-driven strategies um, that are really just about slightly adapting and shifting the way that um, investors are already evaluating startups to make it more objective. And so please feel free to reach out to us with any questions. I put my email in the chat. Um, Amisha put her email in the chat. Um, and we will certainly share the toolkit as soon as it's um uh, published to the world. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions.